Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the pits of Metal Motorcast. This is yours, Dave. Wife Tiny is here. We got drummer Larry Howe from the legendary Vicious Rumors. How's it going, brother? What's happening, man? Happy Monday evening. It's Ash Monday for me. <laughs> oh, there you go. Metal Monday. Metal Monday. That's actually where Vicious Rumors started back in the early 80s. Really? Um, oh, yeah. Exodus, Metallica, everybody was playing the old Waldorf. It was a nightclub in San Francisco. And Vicious Rumors was playing there in like the early 80s. I used to go watch them before I joined them. <laughs> yeah, the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, that's kind of where it all started, Bay Area. Uh -huh. But awesome. Metal Mondays is, uh, is, is legendary. So now Jeff originally started the band in 1979, correct? Yes, he came up from Hawaii and he came to the Bay Area. And uh, I met him, like I said, I would go see Vicious Rumors. I actually knew of them because of a friend of mine at work. And uh, he would say, hey, let's go check out Vicious Rumors. That's back when Jeff would come out in the coffin. It was pretty crazy. They, they had pole bears that would bring him out on stage. And uh, he was, he, they'd open up the coffin and I'd see him inside uh, playing the first wireless guitar I ever saw, like one of Nady's earliest models. And it was pretty theatrical, pretty crazy stuff. And we used to make fun of them. And then my friend said, hey, they got an album contract. And I said, I'll join. <laughs> that was 1985. Mike Varney and uh, Shrapnel Records made that happen. Yeah, the Soldiers of the, night, the, soldiers of the night with Vinnie Moore. Yes, yes, yes. It started off just as a four piece, but Jeff said, you know, Barney's got this gunslinger coming in. He's going to, you know, and Vinny actually flew out from back east and he came and stayed with us for like, or he stayed with Jeff for like three months. And then we were rehearsing like crazy. You know, we were all young and lots of energy and practicing like crazy. And I, I thought he was in the band for, you know, silly me. And, um, and it was pretty amazing. We went into the studio, did the album. I did my tracks all in one day, you know. It's, that's unheard of, you know. And uh, and then Vinny, you know, we did the photo shoot, and Vinny hopped on a plane, and I never saw him again. <laughs> it's kind of bummed, actually. He hopped on a plane? Where'd he go? <laughs> well, he, you know, he continued doing his solo albums. We had to find another guitar player, but, um, you know, I was kind of bummed for that first year or so. But then we ran into Mark McGee, of course, and everything changed for us for Digital Dictator, which is uh, the album, you know, the, our second Strathno release that came out on 80, uh, 87 or 88, something like that. And that's, the, well, I guess 88, because we're doing the 30-year anniversary of that release, and we're doing this big tour. Uh, you know, it's just Jeff and I still. We've got a, couple, a bunch of new recruits that have learned the music, and we're going to be doing this U.S.-Canadian tour all across the states. Got four or five shows in Canada as well, so... You That's start starting off, uh, in September. You start off Friday, uh, August 31st, Santa Rosa, California, right? Yeah, the first show is Santa Rosa. And then we got a couple in Northern California. Hopefully, Redding has, um, will, will have uh, recuperated from their fires. They're going through hell up there right now. But, you know, even when people are stressed, you know, they still need some entertainment. Hopefully, they'll fill up to partnering with us in, the, in a couple of weeks there. I'm hoping that the fires all subside and stuff. There's a lot of tragedy going on up there. And you're coming to Madison Sunday, September 16th? Yes, uh, uh, Wisconsin? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting here looking at the schedule. I'm, and you know, it's, it's a pretty crazy schedule. Yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. And then Friday, Reggie's September 21st. Uh, oh, well, that, well, yes, uh, Chicago, yes. Yes, Chicago. Yeah, we were there about three or four years ago, I think, with a, when we had our Dutch singer with us. Uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah, they still got some, uh, we got some metalheads out there. Hopefully they're going to show up, right? Yeah, there's a lot of metalheads that love fishing rumors out here. Yeah, uh, they're still out there, where, you know, we're all getting a little older here, but we still like to get out and party every now and then, or at least check out the music, if we're, even if we're not partying. You know what? <laughs> but we make it a party. You know what? Metal never gets old. Metal metal makes you feel young forever. Exactly. Like those people, like the, the couple that escaped the old folks home and went to the Wacken Festival in Germany. I was 
reading about. Pretty crazy. They were like 80-something. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so that'll be us. So I'm not too far from that. I just turned 57 yesterday. I'm going to be 60 in three years. It's <laughs> kind of a strange feeling. I'm <laughs> but I'm feeling pretty good. I'm doing all right. I'm turning 18 in six days. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, uh, actually, I just turned 29. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you guys what's uh what's going on do, do you want to i can tell you also we have um you know we're releasing a show we did a year ago the the last show we did with brian allen 40th anniversary live in germany it's a we got a dvd we're going to be selling it at this tour and uh, it's our show at the bang your head festival it's some awesome production 25,000 people, uh, just a great concert. They got a bunch of cameras, and that's going to be only available on tour for the first month or so, and then they'll hopefully have it up online. And uh, some other great news with Vicious Rumors, we we kept, uh, we kept re-signed with SPV, Steam Hammer label. Okay. Uh, it's a German label, and mm-hmm. so they signed us to do two more CDs. So we have extended our rock and roll license a few more years here. So uh, we're going to keep busy with bringing some more killer metal. You know, we're going to keep it in the same vein of, you know, Jeff and I just get together. I start throwing down some double bass beats and he starts, you know, ripping and we see what we can come up with. And now we got some new blood in the band as well. And we're going to see, you know, see what we, what they can add to it. We got this amazing guitar player, this this kid, you know, our, uh, we've had him in there for a few years now. Mr. Gunner Du Gray, and uh, he is just, yeah, he's like 19 years old, the same age as my son, mm-hmm. and he, you know, but he, we already brought him to Europe, Europe with us once, he tours well, he works well, and he has a great time, and plus, we finally have a guitar player that can do the Mark McGee parts, so oh, yeah. that's, I, I'm happy about that, because we've been touring and doing all kinds of stuff, and trying to replace guys that can't, you know, we had some pretty incredibly talented guys, and it's kind of hard to do that stuff unless you really focus on it. And Gunner figured it out. He's one of the only guys that actually was able to figure out these. You know, Mark McGee is a friggin' alien, you know. He's one of those guitar players that just, you know, just the out-of-this-world guy. But he doesn't want to tour anymore. He's kind of happy to hang out where he lives with his wife and do his local shows and not really into metal anymore, you know. Not everybody sticks to it, you know, the way Jeff and I do, I guess. <laughs> But we find guys that like to do it, and uh, mm-hmm. we've got this other singer now. This we found him from an Iron Maiden tribute band, really? and uh, he's he's pretty incredible. His name's Nick Courtney, and um, he's been practicing like crazy, working on the stuff. And he's you know you really got to throw yourself into this kind of thing. You know, to, to emulate Carl is a a way to learn how to sing. You know, if you can hit those notes, and you know we're gonna see how he does night after night, but. Uh, you know, it's, it's a tough job. There'll never be another Carl Albert. That's for damn sure. You know, yeah. may he rest in peace. We lost one of the most incredible singers. You know, Sorry, uh, the guy was like he was a cross of Bruce Dickinson, Jeff Tate, and Dio, all wrapped in one. Plus, he was actually very good looking too, and all the girls loved him. And he had this charisma that was just unheard of. And losing him was just the hardest thing on the planet. You know, he was like a brother. We. We were all such a unit back then, except for we we did have one kind of weak link in the band, but you know the way those things go. <laughs> I'm sure anybody in the band out there listening knows there's always one pain in the ass guy. All the good musicians but, die young. Yeah, die young, leave a good looking corpse. That's what happened with Carl. And uh, so you know, so sorry we lost that boy at 32. You know, he had a brain aneurysm while driving, and. Um, in 1995, and he was in a coma for two weeks, and we, you know, we all lost one of our best friends. Like I said, he was like a brother, and he was just one of those guys you could never be mad at him because he just had this charisma, and everybody just loved him, and it was such a loss. And it's been impossible to replace him. So any singer that's come along to Vicious Rumors has had to deal with this, and it hasn't been easy for them. And that's why we go through them like. You know, uh, as they say, what teenage girls go through underwear or something. I don't know. It's We've gone through a lot of singers. <laughs> it's not an easy job for anybody to keep. Oh, yeah. And then on bass, you got Tillin H. Well, Tillin is our European guy. We've got, a, a, we've got another guy filling in for our tour out here. You know, 
it's, it's hard to make these things happen, but we Gunner, we took Gunner's guitar player from his other band. Um, he's got some crazy grindcore band, and uh, we used his other guitar player as our bassist, and um, you know he's a, he was going to be slamming it out. You know, sometimes when it's not the bass players, one there's a guitar player that has to pick up the slack there and slap on the old bass there and cover the duties because someone's got to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so Larry, what what age did you bring, begin playing drums? Oh well, let's see. Uh, I was uh, I, I was nine years old. I think it was the Nixon administration. It was a long time ago, and the, my father was a jazz musician, and he played uh, saxophone and clarinet. You know, it was just a, a, a virtuoso guy, and you know he had band rehearsals in the living room. I was around music all the time. But Mama knew better, and she bought me this brand new album that just came out. Uh, in the God of Davida. <laughs> and I, I remember just looking at this record, uh, you know, and it had the 20 minute drum solo. And I, I brought it to show and tell for third grade. And, and they wouldn't let me play that song because they said, no, nope, that's, that's too long of a song. And they only let me play one of the B sides. And I was just very incredibly pissed off, little nine year old kid. They wouldn't let me play the 20 minute drum solo. But, um, you know, that's kind of where I, you know, my mom knew I was going to be more of a rocker anyway. But then, of course, once I heard Led Zeppelin, it was all over. And that's, uh, pretty, you know, my biggest influences were like Zeppelin, Sabbath, of course, what's Deep your, Purple, and what's your favorite stuff song like that. My, my favorite what? What's your favorite song of Zeppelin? Oh, that's, that's just impossible to name. I mean, every song on every album is just the, the most incredible music ever written, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, I think when my buddy, my best friend, Mike Casson, you know, may he rest in peace, you know, he was, we all have that childhood friend that, yes. that influenced us, and, and Mike was that for me, and he gave me Led Zeppelin 2 and 4, and he just, you know, because my sisters were always listening to disco, and my one sister was trying to teach me how to dance, it was the 70s, and, and my buddy said, and started slapping me, I said, no, 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 here, listen to the Zeppelin, this is the shit, and uh, so... He gave me two and four, and I just listened to you know, you know those, those two albums religiously, and then and right about that time, Physical Graffiti had just come out, and I I just remember the first time I heard Custard Pie, and it just it, they all mean so much to me, and then and then Presence was this brand new album, and I just remember going to high school just thinking of every song on that album, you know, every song, every album has its own meaning to me, so it's impossible to say which one's my favorite. <laughs> I thought you were going to pick Moby Dick. Well, you know, of course, it's got the great drum solo, but that's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a drummer that loves great guitar playing, and I love, you know, how drum, that's a, the beauty of John Bonham, the way he molded his drumming style with the guitar playing of Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. And those guys really started power singing, power riffs, and speed metal drumming it all started from those guys if you listen to the live version of Days That Confused you hear that speed metal drum beat before anybody was doing it that's the same drum beat I do on every friggin Vicious Rumors album you know you know just the the way Bonham attacks it you know of course Bonham didn't have double bass but of course once I heard uh, Fast as a Shark you know by Except in 1982 I knew what to do with a couple of bass drums and uh you know, you, you, we take our influences from what we listen to, and you know, we're still still doing it to this day. I listen to you know old music all the time. I'm not really up on much new metal or any new stuff. You know, we kind of stick to what we like pretty much all our lives. So, Larry, what's been your uh, fondest memory of being in the band Vicious Rumors? Well, uh, after traveling the world sixty times and seeing so many different cultures and people and places. I mean, it's just such a plethora, it's hard to really say. I, you know, I think the, the, the zenith of when, when metal was big, when we were signed to Atlantic and going to Japan in 1992, when we were on top of the world and we get off the airplane and there's people with signs, with you know banners with our names on it. And I think that might have been the most incredible time because, you know, the, the shows were sold out. We were just going, why are we leaving? We should just stay here for a month and tour religiously. But 
the Japanese are very cautious in how they book and how they tour. It's almost impossible to make it happen. You know, if anybody's ever tried to book a tour in Japan, they know what I'm talking about. They, they only let you do it their way. But, um, you know, that was kind of the pinnacle of that the whole thing. And, of course, 1993 came along and everything changed. Atlantic Records completely slashed their metal department, you know, that, that, uh, that you know, the grunge took over. And uh, so we continued on through our European labels and kept playing the heavy metal shows there. You know, everything kind of changed around that time. And, of course, I went on to be married. I actually quit the band for a while. You know, I guess everybody's got to give it a little try every now and then. And that didn't work out. As soon as he divorced me, I was on the phone with Jeff saying, okay, I'm ready to come back in. But, you know, the whole time I was married, six or seven years, everybody was all talking about it anyway. I tried to tell Mark McGee this. I said, hey, even if you quit the band, you're still in it. <laughs> kind of the way it goes. It's a lifelong commitment, you know. And we, we, you know, we did make albums when they mattered. And thanks to those great records we made, we're always going to have some kind of notoriety and people are going to want to hear it. You know, we got to do a new album to stay relevant, but uh, everybody wants, then you get there and people want to hear the old shit. <laughs> the way it goes. So uh, besides playing the whole digital dictator in its entirety, are you going to play a lot of the other albums? Yeah, we're going to do the whole album. Um, and then we're going to throw, you know, we'll have probably about four or five other songs here and there off the other albums. You know, probably just our, we got to do the, the ones that have the most notoriety and the most hits on YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we're still just kind of throwing it all together. We'll see what works. But definitely, it's a celebration of Digital Dictator, you know, 30 years. You know, as many people say, it's our best album. And, th and by the way, that album took, uh, for me, for my tracking, I took, uh, you know, Soldiers of the Night took one day. Digital Dictator took two days. <laughs> Which is still unheard of, you know. Now I got to do an album. I'm in there for a couple of weeks. <laughs> the way it goes. Now, after being in all the years in this band, what, what's one of your most embarrassing moments that you can talk about? Embarrassing moments. Well, uh, probably when I had some bad Chinese food in Austria, and we did a show, and and they uh, we finished up, and I was like, I had to run to the bathroom. <laughs> And, uh, oh, yeah, and I learned how to sing a nice song about it. Uh, I shit my pants in German, so, uh, ich habe in mein Hosen geschissen. <laughs> and they turned around and said, what the hell, Larry? It's like that bad Chinese movie in Austria, and I run into the bathroom. You know, that's you, life on the road. Shit happens you, you, you shit when you least pants? expect it. You shit in your pants? <laughs> yeah, ich habe in mein Hosen geschissen. Es riecht nicht nach Blumen. Yeah, I've been hanging out in Germany too much. I learned a little bit of German, you know. Comes in handy. Yeah, you know, we've watched those countries change. We've been going over there for so long. And, you know, 30 years ago, there certainly weren't any kind of terrorist activities going on, you know. It was, we played the Dynamo Festival in 1989. 30,000 Dutch crazy metalheads, you know. Those festivals, the way they do it over there is just insane. It's just you know, they're still having these big festivals. There's such a culture of metal over there. You know, I don't know how, you know, flooding the whole place with all these immigrants is going to change any of that eventually. But, um, you know, did you hear about crazy the, stuff. Wait, did you hear about the Flotsam Jetsam tour? They, when, they were in, uh, when they were out there in Europe, they were attacked by the bus by the um, Muslim people? Yeah, uh, well... If they got a mark on you, I guess, you know, it's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, that can happen just about anywhere. I think that even happened to destruction, too. I think Schmier said something about that. Yeah, Schmier, yeah you know, I remember he said that. Some crazy shit out there, you know. You got to be ready for it. We played at that club in Paris, like, a year before that. We were on tour with Hammerfall. We played in Paris, yeah, the club yeah, Bataclan. And uh, then a year later, that big uh, event happened, you know, 100-something... Fans were killed and maimed, and guys had their their wieners chopped off and shoved in their mouths. I mean, it was just a bloodbath, and just yeah. it's sickening. It's just absolutely sickening that these freakish Islamic pieces of shit would do this stuff. And, you know, uh, I and also uh, and then guess, people make excuses for them. I don't get it personally, but and then, it's just a horrible, you know, part of the ugliest part of humanity showing itself. So, so I'm I just gonna ask you something off the wall. What do you think about the president? Sure. 
What do you think about the president? Uh, well, you know, that's the big that's the big polarizing thing. People are either love him or hate him. It's just a crazy thing. Just you know, it's got the nation polarized, you know, have, the world's been split into two people, those who believe a whole bunch of bullshit and those who don't, and I'm just going to leave it at that, <laughs> but um, let's get back to, to yeah, let's get back to music here, okay, so, we, we just want to talk about good shit, so, you know the Anthrax, vi- Anthrax 7 inch vinyl they came out with after the Paris attack? What's that about Anthrax, who, what? You know, you know the Anthrax 7 inch vinyl they came out with? After the I'm not, I'm not so familiar with, uh, you know, we did a couple of shows with those guys. Yeah, but they came, uh, they came out with a seven inch vinyl and I bought it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a pretty cool vinyl. Well, make sure you go out and buy that, uh, the 40th anniversary live in Germany of Vicious Rumors from the Banger Head Festival. That's going to be the big, uh, our big release. But they'll, they'll be doing some new records on SPV as well. When I see you guys in Chicago or Madison, I'll buy it. Is that where you guys located exactly? Yeah, we're right in between. Okay. So, yes, that should be interesting. Um, yeah, we're hanging out there a lot. We're doing Des Moines, Dubuque, Kansas City, Madison, Minneapolis, Sioux Falls. So we haven't really been in that upper Bible Belt area in a long time. So hopefully the metalheads will come out and see us on all these obscure places. <laughs> we'll probably see you kind in of a, probably also. I don't know. Well, it's a lot of small clubs and stuff, so it won't take too many to pa- make it packed. No, we're, we're, I'm still deciding where to drive to Des Moines, Madison, or Chicago. I'll just go to them all. <laughs> you never know. It could be just I, a, so much fun. You just can't get enough. I can't afford it all. Yeah. Well, just go to the ones that uh, work for you. The closest ones. You know, we're just uh, driving around in a van, booking Airbnbs, and, you know, doing our thing. Yeah, so so now, in 2001 to 2005, you were in Chastain. How'd you, how'd you get in Chastain? Uh, well, that was because I was married to the singer. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't really so much in Chastain as she was. She had done one album with him, and then I married her. Uh, uh, another bad subject, <laughs> but, um, you know, then I did the one album with, um, them, uh, in 2002 or something like this. And, uh, uh, you know, I call it a FedEx album. It was like the first time I did an album, you know, it was the first time, you know, the, the digital thing really, you know, I'm playing to a click track and. It was the first time I, you know, started doing that. All my albums before that were done analog. I kind of like the analog feel and sound so much better. But I guess it was the new millennium. I had to try this whole new thing out. The click is your friend, I guess. And so, um, you know, we, I, I told the wife, oh, okay, okay, sure, what the hell, I'll do this thing. And, uh, you know, we did the little video. and But then she wound up leaving me some, for some other guitar player. And oh my God. She's back east now with my son, so... Uh, you know, shit happens. That's the way that goes. So no, I, I never did any shows with Chastain or anything. I just did the album. But but you did do a tour of Wasp in 2006, right? Uh, well, right when I had rejoined Vicious Rumors, you know, uh, um, you know, our buddy Ira Black, who was in the, you know, he was in BR when I rejoined, but then he went ahead and moved on. And he was on tour with Wasp, and he had a talk with Blackie, who was kind of frustrated about his drummer situation. And Ira played him Welcome to the Ball. And apparently Blackie really liked Welcome to the Ball. It was interesting. And then he said, hey, Blackie's going to call you. And I'm like, ooh, wow, Blackie's going to call me. Oh, it was a big, it was a big to-do. It was, you know, pretty exciting. I had just finished my tracks for, um, you know, War Ball, Vicious Rumors, you know, we were, you know, we were put together a new album, War Ball, and it was getting ready. And, you know, when you, when you do your drum tracks, the album doesn't usually come out for another six months. So I had a couple of months to kill, and then suddenly I get this call from Blackie, and it was pretty amazing. He's like, hello. And I'm like, wow, hey, you know, here's a guy I've been listening to for a long time. I, you know, I love the Wasp music. 
And um, he started complimenting me on the drumming of on uh, Welcome to the Ball. And I was like, wow, I had no idea he cared. He was commenting about like, making interesting comments like, I love the way you use that ride cymbal. It's kind of like a, another rhythm guitar. And, you know, I get all that kind of stuff from John Bonham, you know, smashing that ride cymbal. And it is, it is, you know, it's kind of like another rhythm guitar over there. You know, so the guy was paying attention to my drumming. It was really interesting. And he said, hey, well, come on down and we'll try you out. So I I sat there and I learned a bunch of Wasp songs. I went down there and I, I played about 25 or 30 of them with them. It was very interesting, but it was very, very standoffish. Of, I don't know, it was something about it. It was that L.A. scene. It was kind of, you know, I'm a Bay Area guy and I'm not really into the whole, you know, rat race thing of the, that is L.A. and the scene and the vibe and you got to have a certain look and everything and I'm just kind of like kick back and chill, whatever. But I had a great time at the at the audition, even though Blackie came up and said, uh, one thing about this, there will be no singing at this audition. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll shut up. And um, so it was interesting, though. We went through all these songs, and he was pretty amazed that I knew them all. And it was pretty cool. I had a great time. and But then he started picking my brain, and he said, uh, well, are you happy? And I was, no, oh, you know, I'm kind of bummed, you know, the... You know, the, the wife left me or whatever, but I'm happy that I got this, you know, VR's got a new album. Things are going to be happening. Here we go. And that was the wrong answer. I think I was supposed to say, no, I won't be happy until I'm the drummer of Wasp or something. Because I went down there and it was a very interesting week. I, I stayed in this little compound there and and um, I was going to rehearse with it. He said, okay, we're going to rehearse. We're going to record an album. Then the tour starts in two weeks. I'm like, okay. Um, so I started practicing my drums in this little side room and it was shaking the walls off the place and he didn't, he thought it was too loud. So he had the bass player buy me a pair of brushes and I was like, okay, uh, it, it was, a, it, let's just say this, it was a very odd week of my life, but he gave me a check and I got the hell out of there and that was that. <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> and I, and I was, I just went back to my VR thing. I, I, you know. I, I spent a week in L.A. and, you know, I won't talk too bad about him because he gave me a nice check and it was interesting and it was, you know, I would have liked to check it out. But I'm not really, you know, I, I like to play live. I was, you know, whole, you know, almost all these drummers, they always wear the headset and they're bringing, you know, the drummer is the keyboard player, is the background vocal player, all that crap. I'm like, you know, I, I Vicious Rumors has never done that. We don't do backing tracks, you know. I did that with the Van Halen tribute band, and I, 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 you know, we didn't have, we didn't want to hire a keyboard player for just one song. And so I go, okay, I'll try that. And I had the whole keyboard parts for Jump in my headphones, and I played along. It was interesting, but you know, I'm sitting there with a you know, pair of headphones on, and it's kind of bizarre. I like to just rock out and play, you know. Yeah. We don't do backing tracks, and I was kind of focused on trying to figure out how I was going to do this backing track thing with Wasp. And he wanted to do record an album and, uh, you know, everything. But then everything got pushed around anyway. It was a very bizarre experience, like I said. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it is what it is. And uh, I went on to continue my career with Vicious Rumors. And we've made a few albums since then and had a lot of fun on tour and done a lot of crazy tours. Now, do you guys have any uh, thing written for a new album yet? Uh, we got a lot of great ideas. I'm waiting to hear what my uh, my new Wonder Boy has got up his sleeve because uh, Gunner's got lots of great ideas. Jeff's got some riffs. You know, it just takes getting together, and that's hard when everybody's in different parts of the world right now. So we're looking forward to this tour. We're all going to be hanging out. We're going to have some time. We're going to be talking about that, and then hopefully, you know, at some point, we're going to get together and rehearse and just work on uh, riffs and ideas. And I put it all together. And I'm, probably it should be out, you know, next year. It takes a while to put these things together. Right. But and there's definitely more ideas coming. So now with the 30th anniversary of G Digital Dictator Tour, what are you uh, guys looking to do for a set? About an hour 45, maybe hour and a half, somewhere on there? Yeah, probably an hour and a half. We're not, you know, we got other bands, you know, we're just we're keeping it short. We can't kill ourselves too much, uh, you know. You know, Beatles only played 20 minutes. You know? <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll do the whole album plus about four or five others. 
And uh, then we got to pack up and get ready to drive another six hours or seven hours to the next city, you know? Yeah. We're not doing a tour bus, because if you do a tour bus, nobody makes a dime. Right. If you rent a van, you drive yourself, you book some hotel rooms or Airbnb, you can actually make some money. But the two, I mean, I've done them both, and uh, tour bus is fun. There's, there's pros and cons. I mean, it's great to have, you know, the, the comfort of your own bunk to crash in, but then you're stuck on this damn tour bus, and if wherever it goes, you go, you can't go anywhere but. And with the car, you got a lot more, uh, or a van, you know, you can go around and see things and check, you know, stop and pull off and check shit out. And, and uh, plus you spend, you know, staying in a hotel or Airbnb, you can get a house, a three-bedroom house for a hundred bucks for five guys. It's great, you know? Yeah. And it's just roughing it, you know, a little lack of sleep here and there. So there's some long-ass drives. There's a few short ones. Uh, you know, it's just called hard work, have a good time, and... You know, make make the show, get there in one piece, and rock and roll, man. So now, currently, Larry, and, do, you, do you have any endorsements currently? No, I've tried a few, and use the, the, the you know the products I like, um, which I won't name because they don't want to give me anything for free. You know, they'll they'll probably give you, uh, uh, you know, they just they just make you go through a bunch of hoops, and I I don't sit there and bug them, and you know, I, if I probably tried harder, I could, but. I I just you know I just go buy this shit and break it. <laughs> That's why I have a day job. All right. So I'm gonna ask you a few fun questions before I finish off this interview. Ready for a few sure. fun questions? What's your favorite food to eat? What, what's that? I'm sorry. What's your favorite food to eat? You like to eat? My favorite food. Favorite food. What do you like to eat? What's your favorite food? <laughs> Oh, well, I love steak, of course, and uh, I love some, well, and a good grilled salmon. You know, I love all kinds of food. I'm definitely a, a foodaholic. I love it all. I love to cook, actually. I'm a really good cook, too. I always cook on the road. Everybody loves it when I cook. Okay, so you like to eat eel, squid, and octopus, too? Like the what? She said, do you like these eel, squid, and octopus, too? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Sushi, as far as, like, Tuna and salmon. I, anything that's with the consistency of rubber, I'm not really into, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not into eating foot soles and stuff like that. I don't know. No, I, I like the normal stuff, you know, beef, chicken, fish, and pork. And I, I'm not really into lamb or buffalo or anything like that <laughs> or alligator. We, You know, they sell some weird shit at these places we tour and some guys will sit there and say, hey, try this alligator. Hey, Hal, I'm going to try the buffalo balls. No thanks. I don't think I want to try that. <laughs> so what? what's your favorite beverage of choice, Larry? Oh, well, it's got to be Jack Daniels. <laughs> you know, I have to keep it in moderation these days. I get in trouble, you know. They don't show that part of this video, <laughs> the 40th anniversary. If they had the after show, then it would probably be the most entertaining, but I got in a lot of trouble. But, you know, at least I get through the show, okay? So sh straight <laughs> straight Jack Daniels, or you mix it with anything? Jack and Coke. Oh, straight. I used to no, I used to drink Jack and Coke, but, yeah, why screw up a good whiskey? You know, now it's just on the rocks. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's bad for you. All that sugar, soda, uh, soda sucks. No. <laughs> now, thinking of Jack and Coke, have you ever, have you ever met Lemmy? Have I what? I was like, we're talking about Jack and Coke for a second. Have you ever met Lemmy? I, I'm having a hard time understanding because it's so muddy here. Uh, I say we, we, uh, you were mentioning Jack and Coke. Have you ever met Lemmy? Oh, Lemmy. Yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Way back in 1989 when we, our first time to England, we were hanging out. Um, we played at the Marquee in London and... Uh, all, all, all those guys showed up. King Diamond was there. I was backstage hanging out with him, and I was doing a little King Diamond uh, you know, imitation. He loved it. I was like, oh, I kind of see him. Oh. He, he was loving it. And so me and Mickey D were hanging out at the bar, drinking, yucking it up, and Mickey D was telling me about how he uses two condoms. And I was like, how the hell do you put two condoms on? And we're having a great time, and Lenny was over in the corner playing the video games, and I was apparently laughing a little too loud or something and Lemmy looks over from his video games and says, I say that for the stage, mate, you're obnoxious. <laughs> so, yeah, 
and then I met him like a few years later, and he said, oh, I remember you. So I, I must have made a good impression or a bad one. I don't know. But the funner part was going to the club with King, King Diamond later when when he was talking about these the, uh, the Jamaican guards that didn't, they were hassling him. And he looked at me and said, I wish I had my voodoo dolls. And he's like making stabbing motions into his hand. I was like, wow, he's, I think he really has voodoo dolls. But King Diamond was actually the sweetest guy on the planet. Man, we had a great time. Cool. And um, yes, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, so. That was my brief encounter with Lenny, you know. May he rest in peace. Yeah. So now, outside of drumming, drumming, uh, do you have any other hobbies? Oh, the what? Outside of drumming, do you have any other hobbies? Um, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I spend time with my kids when I can. Um, we like to take some walks, take some hikes, uh, go, you know, I like to cook. Um... I like to ride my bike if I can, but I don't do that near enough. Hiking is awesome, but no, I'm you know I work. I don't have a whole lot of hobbies. I you know I haven't built a model of anything in a long time. That's for sure. <laughs> I I used to like trains. I had train models when I was a kid. That was pretty cool. But no, uh, I haven't relived that one either. Now, do you have any advice for any young and upcoming drummers that might be listening to the interview? Yeah, just listen to John Bonham if you want to learn how to play. You know, you got to emulate that attack. You have to emulate how, you know, you know, listen to music. You have to love music to keep doing this because, you know, God knows we're not in it for the money. <laughs> if, you, if you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. You have to do it because you love it. And um, you have to just love music to play it and uh, beat the crap out of them things, have a good time, you know, put some dynamics here and there. Listen, you know, I, I just like to play when I can because that's our passion. You know, it's what it's what stops us from. You know, it, it saves the world from me. <laughs> you know, it's everybody needs a passion. So find your passion, and hopefully, if it's drumming, you get to beat the crap out of something, and you you, you get all your aggressions out. It's a great thing. Cool. Well, well, Larry, I want to thank you very much for taking time to do an interview tonight. Certainly. Thank you, and I hope uh, I hope many people hear it, and I hope many people around U.S. and Canada come see our tour, Vicious Rumors 30-Year Anniversary of Digital Dictator, where you can buy the, the new DVD of our live show at the Bang Your Head Festival. Awesome. awesome. I'm going to play this song. Thanks a lot, my friend. No, no problem. I'm going to play the song Digital Dictator right now. Awesome. All right, Remember. You have, you have, a good, good night. Have, have a good night, brother. All right, later. Later.